Peace and welcome to the culture right here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for checking in, folks. Today, we got a power-packed show for you. First, we're going to talk about the latest in Russia as Finland is seeking a a membership with NATO. We're going to discuss this, the impact of this with our uh, analyst, Dr. Gerald Horn, to give us the latest about it. Also, the big question, to rent or to buy, is that what are you figuring out trying to do when you move into a new place. Well, we're going to talk to realtor Cassandra London to give us some insight and tips on what to think about as we make that big decision. Also, we're going to talk about the trials of Black Lives Matter. We know that there have been some money issues, but we're going to be checking in with BLM's LA co-founder chapter, chapter co-founder Melina Abdullah to give us the latest about the harassment she received at Cal State along with talking about funding and money issues and the overall impact of Black Lives Matter. And then later, we check in with mental health advocate and race scholar, uh, Brother Richard Rowe, to talk about when is the proper time, what's the proper way to discuss racism with your children. We got a lot to get to, so stay with us. It's all happening on today's edition of The Culture, right here on Black Star Network. Folks, it's time to ready to rock and roll. Let's go. Folks, welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. So excited about the big conversations that we got lined up for you today. We're also going to be joined by our culture crew that you see here every Thursday. We're going to be joined in a few moments by uh, with Mr. Hassan Giordano, Mr. Politics himself. And we'll, later on, we'll talk to Rashad Statton um, as we get their insight about all of these big conversations. But first, let's talk about the latest that's happening in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Finland has announced today, folks, that they are seeking membership with NATO, and this decision will just throw everything into a loop. As Finland tries to get with NATO, it will infuriate Russia, saying, and Russia going as far as to say that if Finland joins NATO, that it would take retaliatory steps. Now, also, uh, of course, the United States of America is all in support of this idea, as well as some of the European allies in NATO in that part of the world. But what impact will this really make on that ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine? Here to talk to us and has been talking to us about this issue of Russia and Ukraine has been a professor of history and uh, and race from the University of Houston, our very own Dr. uh, Dr. Gerald Horn. Dr. Horn, good afternoon, sir. How are you? There we go. Dr. Horn, how are you today, sir? Oh, it's all good. What about you? Um, I'm good, Doc. I am good. Um, I also want to bring in our uh, uh, culture crew member, Mr. Pol- Mr. Politics himself, Hassan Giordano, into this conversation. Hassan, good to see you again, brother. Thank you for checking in with us. Can you hear me, Hassan? I can. Uh, awesome. Play. Awesome. Awesome. Dr. Horn, let's start with you, sir. Uh, Finland made this big announcement today that they are seeking membership with NATO. NATO is all in, European alliances are all in, the allies rather are all in, the United States are all in, but Russia, Russia is saying, you make this move, Finland, we're gonna have a very, very big problem, saying that they will take retaliatory steps to address this decision. Talk to us a little bit about this history first between Finland and Russia, Dr. Horn, and why this decision is uh, angering Kremlin, the Kremlin in Moscow so much. Well, you are correct to say that Moscow is infuriated, and that does not bode well. Uh, with regard to the history, recall that Finland, which only has a contemporary population of about 5 million compared to Russia's about 160 million, was once part of the Tsarist Empire, the Russian Empire, before the Russian Revolution of 1917. However, I'm afraid to say that a few decades later, Finland and Russia were at war, 
Uh, Finland did well to begin with, but eventually lost. And that helped to generate decades of concord between the then Soviet Union and Finland. And we had thought that that concord would extend to Finland's relationship uh, with Russia. As your graphic suggests, they share an 830 mile long border. And if Russia was upset with Ukraine joining the US dominated North Atlantic Treaty Organization known as NATO, which Russia perceives as having daggers pointed at its throat, it's even more upset about Finland. Uh, keep in mind that the Bulletin of Atomic Sciences for decades now has maintained a clock whereby midnight is the witching hour when the world moves closer to a nuclear holocaust that would incinerate all of humanity. I dare say that if you look at their clock today, we are probably about two minutes to midnight. And I do not say that with any sense of satisfaction. However, it's not impossible to reverse the negative aspects of this decision. First of all, as we've talked about on the culture previously, you have very important elections coming up in France in a few weeks. France has expressed nervousness all along about this conflict with Russia. And if the left does well in the parliamentary elections, you can expect uh, even more pushback uh, from France. Keep in mind as well that this joining or apparent attempt to join NATO uh, by Finland also raises questions as to why uh, France and Germany were hostile to Ukraine joining NATO, uh, since they're analogous in terms of being close to the Russian border. And in any case, uh, Sweden apparently is in the on-deck circle. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was just in Stockholm. Apparently, they're going to uh, sign some sort of mutual security pact with London. Uh, this does not bode well with regard to Stockholm's relationship with Moscow. So all in all, it seems to me that this crisis has just deepened. And, 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 and we have to say that Sweden is also submitting an application to to join NATO as well um, because of, of Russia's invasion into Ukraine. So this is all as a result of Russia's invasion into Ukraine that Finland and Sweden um, is looking to join the North American uh, alliance. But the question becomes, with Russia saying that it would take retaliatory steps and there were some there were some discussion about possibly using some sort of nuclear arms. I mean, what what are we seeing right now? What do you think we can sh we should expect um, if this if Finland's application and you know goes through, which I believe it will? What what should we expect from Russia at this point, Doctor Horn? Well, it's difficult to predict, but I must say, like many commentators, I've been rather surprised that there have not been more cyber attacks, uh, not only within Ukraine, but even in Western Europe and perhaps the United States itself. Uh, that is to say, shutting down the internet, for example. Uh, that is to say, shutting down electric electricity, uh, for example. Uh, perhaps given the fact that Helsinki, the capital of Finland, is so close to St. Petersburg, perhaps the leading city uh, in Russia, you can possibly expect uh, more intelligence activities by Russian agents within uh, Finland itself. So once again, all bets are off. And I'm afraid to say that this crisis is deepening. And your listeners should pay careful and close attention to an article in the New York Times on the front page yesterday, where the New York Times, which has expressed few reservations about the deepening U.S. involvement in the Ukraine, in fact, it's been a major cheerleader, its front page article wondered Queriously, uh, in a questioning manner, of why there hasn't been more debate about the deepening U.S. involvement in the Ukraine. You have these multi-billion dollar packages sailing through Congress uh, with hardly any opposition with the entire Democratic caucus, including the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, voting in favor. At the same time, as we've said many times before in this program, you have a homelessness crisis in Los Angeles and San Francisco and many cities in the United States. Apparently, that does not rise to the level of national emergency, unlike this crisis in Ukraine, where Congress is throwing money at Kiev like there's no tomorrow. And 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 I want to go back to something you said. Do you foresee Russia possibly trying to sabotage? I um, mean, you mentioned cyber, you know, cyber attacks, but do you see Russia trying to interrupt 
uh, Finland's efforts to to join NATO at any in, in any capacity? Oh, uh, definitely. I can imagine that there are intense uh, diplomatic consultations uh, taking place between the Finnish ambassador in Russia and the Russian ambassador in Finland. Uh, I'm sure that thinly veiled threats will be floated. Uh, you should not be shocked. But keep in mind as well, something we've also been stressing on the culture, uh, which is that Russia is not without weapons. Right. Recall that what's happening is that the Western European allies of the United States are trying to wean itself off from Russian natural gas and nat Russian oil, and that's leading it into Africa. But you just saw the visit to Algeria by Russian Foreign Minister, Minister Sergei Lavrov, where he was welcomed with open arms because the Algerians feel that this crisis gives them leverage, whereby they can charge more for their natural gas and their oil, which goes into Spain and Italy in particular, and trying to wean Western Europe away from Russian energy, it's like trying to change the jet engine of an airplane while it's flying at 30,000 feet. It's very difficult. It's going to necessarily uh, help to introduce economic and financial strains into Western Europe, which will have knock-on effects, ricocheting effects here in the United States of America. Uh, Mr. Biden has spoken about uh, Russia as being a culprit in terms of U.S. inflation, the fact that mothers find it difficult to find baby formula, the fact that gasoline at the pump is creeping past $6 to $7 in California. And he has something, uh, that, that's a point that, that he's making that's worth considering. But part of this wound is self-inflicted when it comes to the United States of America, uh, there was no necessary reason for the United States to deepen its involvement in this conflict to the point where even Western European allies are raising questions about what Pentagon chief Lloyd Austin said a few days ago, which is that the purpose is not necessarily to prop up Ukraine in this conflict, but to weaken Russia. And recall that Mr. Biden himself has called for regime change in Moscow, which right. obviously is going to cause Russia to dig in its heels uh, even more. Would that lead, Dr. Horn, would that lead to some sort of military action by Russia into Finland uh, at this point? Do you expect some, some type of boots on the ground effort um, beyond the cyber attacks, you think? Well, I, I hope not, because it, it, it'll take a while for right. the charter of NATO, Article 5, which calls for assistance to Finland if it faces any kind of external threat. It'll take a while for that provision to kick in. But with Mr. Johnson of London being in Scandinavia only recently, if Russia intervenes in Finland, you can expect Britain to intervene to counter that. And then since London is the closest ally of Washington, you might expect Washington inter to intervene as well. Supposedly, the United States is not going to commit boots on the ground with regard to this European conflict. But I'm afraid to say that all signs are pointing in that direction. And when we talk about boots on the ground, we're talking about black feet in those boots on the ground. This is um, and, and, and one of the other things is, of course, we've been talking about this um, since this whole conflict started, Dr. Horn, that this conflict, which started between two countries, is 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 gradually widening to to include other folks other countries especially in europe uh article five of the north atlantic treaty it talks about uh this idea that that defenses will be made if any country in europe or north america is attacked so essentially that this article says that if if an outside group outside country or or uh, you know were to attack North America or any any countries that are involved in NATO, the stance of NATO would be: if you attack them, you attack all of us. And and tell me, you know, how does this this Article Five, which I believe is the core of where of how NATO is is which is the foundation of NATO, how is this going to impact this 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 unfolding developing landscape that we're seeing with this war? Well, basically what Article 5 suggests is that the United States, uh, perhaps uh, your cousins, your nephews, perhaps you yourself, Faraji Muhammad, are now bound to come to the defense of Finland, a country of 5 million, 
versus Russia's 160 million if Russia decides to attack Finland. What's interesting about this is that recall, if you look at the tapes of our discussions in the last few weeks, we've talked openly and freely about how it appears that there are those in Washington who would like to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. Now it seems that we're in a different stage where many of the Europeans would like to fight Russia to the last US tax dollar, or perhaps if the situation continues to devolve to the last US soldier. It's very ominous, very dangerous. Hassan, uh, you know, as, as you're listening to this, what's, what's your take on this, bro? Well, there's a lot to unpack. Um, you know, Doc hit on a lot. First of all, I think many in America looking at this ongoing conflict are wondering why is America so deeply involved in this, especially when you have Congress. When the House just passed a $40 billion package to go to Kiev. The Senate is waiting in the wings to pass that, to send this type of money over there when aid here in America is starving, right? Gas prices right. are raising, the inflation is going on. And Americans are starting to wonder, why would you continuously give billions of dollars and be able to find this level of money in such a moment's notice, a blink of an eye, when right here domestically we have so many other issues that we can be dealing with with this type of money? Um, but I think abroad, you got to look at just, you know, the overall impact. The former Russian president and prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, just said himself that he's currently the deputy chair of Russia's Security Council. He said that NATO risks provoking a full-fledged nuclear war by allowing Sweden and Finland in through NATO. Now, this is somebody who has directly tied, direct ties to the Kremlin, who does not speak you know, out of the side of their neck, who are, is showing some type of force in recognizing that we can't have these two countries, Finland being the longest border, like Doc was talking about, with Russia out of all the European Union's 27 members, this is yeah. certainly not an escalation that uh, anybody in the European Union, a part of NATO, can just take lightly. Now, they do. I do expect them to kind of try to expedite both Sweden and Finland's application. Uh, they do have to wait a period of time before between when the application is submitted and when the lawmakers and all 30 uh, existing members of NATO have to ratify uh, their approval into NATO. My question is, I, I never understood how NATO, which was designed as a treaty organization back in 1949, guarantees the safety and freedom of its members by political and military means, but NATO themselves don't even have a military, all right? And I think a lot of people are seeing, you know, the conflict as Ukraine being the kind of scrawny kid on the, on the playground who punched a bully in the mouth and <laughs> continues to be this scrappy fighter that the bully didn't just run over. And so Russia's kind of really in the mix of, you know, they I think they really thought that they were just going to run right through Ukraine and, and you know, continue on with, with its mission. Um, but that has not been the case. And so you see some of these smaller countries that used to be a part of the USSR who are now trying to hide behind and or join this NATO ally. Um, and Russia realizes that, you know, that's something that they're going to make sure that they try uh, to include to make sure it never happens. Hassan, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and, and Dr. Horn, I'd like to get your take on this, but but Hassan, I'm wondering, all of this happening, all of this is happening within an election year. Like, like for Democrats to try to stay in power during this election cycle, how does this thing play out? I mean, the way that President Biden is moving. Um, he's already, you know, challenged by low approval ratings. So, 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 what do you think is going to happen over these next couple of weeks as more and more states start to go through their primaries and then leading up, of course, to the general in November? How do you think this is all going to impact the election? Well, typically, you know, in presidential elections, um, the the party in power typically, especially if the president has low approval ratings, we saw this during the Bush administration. You know, if, if there's a possibility of you not win a re-election, start a war. Because most of the times Americans don't want to transfer leadership powers in the midst of a war. Now, mind you, this is not America's war. So that's a far different cry than, you know, when we went in to Iraq with weapons of mass destruction. Two different things, right? This is not particularly our war because we don't have boots on the ground. But I think this does continue 
as this Russian Ukraine effort continues, conflict continues, it dogs the political uh, ratings, the approval ratings of this president. Um, but it, I don't think that it's going to have a major impact in the uh, midterm elections based off of congressional members, other than possibly the level of funding that we continuously see approved going out. That may be an issue. But right now, the main issue, obviously, is abortion, the, the ruling that came from the Supreme Court, pocketbook issues that we're going to see, inflation. Those are the main issues that are going to galvanize people to the polls to vote one way or the other. It seems at this point, the Republicans probably are, are a, a, a good dead set of taking back the House and possibly the Senate as well, just based off of economic issues. I don't think the war is going to have that grave of an impact but i think as long as it continues to stretch on and and and, and go further then that does hurt the biden administration's approval ratings overall and we got about 30 seconds but i, I definitely want to get your take on this doc and then and then uh, dr horn i mean hassan and then dr horn um looking at the fact that the president never has officially held a press conference or held an a, rather an address either from the Oval Office or from Congress to say, to lay out what the plan is uh, for this for this whole conflict, Hassan. It's like, it's like just big decisions are being made. A lot of money is being spent, but no one is talking to the American people. And they don't want to, because I think if they know that if they do speak to the American people, the American people will tell them, don't say nothing over it. Like we, most people say, we'll give some aid. You, you'll see that you know, in terms of Americans, if they want to give their own money, but spending that level of government funding when Americans are suffering on every level, like the doc said, from homelessness to, to food deserts and the list goes on and on and on during inflation. No, absolutely not. I, I think the president does want to stay away from, again, boots on the ground, being perceived as America getting in this war. But like doc said, Boris Johnson said himself, the prime minister, um, said that he would defend if Russia was to go to war with Sweden or Finland because he was just over there um, in both countries um, signing a military uh, excursion and said that they would defend them at all costs. And again, because of the relationship that we have with the UK, you can almost assert that if they're going to go to war, then America is going to follow suit. So Doc hit that right on the nail on the head with that. And I think you'll see a different tune coming from the president if that happens. Dr. Horn? Well, only thing I would say is that the danger for the Democrats and Mr. Biden is that Mr. Biden's rhetoric might be turned against him. Mr. Mm -hmm. Biden has been saying that inflation is largely due to Mr. Putin. The Republicans can flip that script and say, well, there was no necessity for you to deepen U.S. involvement in Ukraine waving a red flag before the bull that is Moscow. And keep in mind that in these House votes where I said the Democratic caucus has voted unanimously uh, for these aid packages uh, in the billions to Kiev, it's interesting that the only opposition has come from the Republicans. And that would allow the Republicans perhaps to pose as the party of peace, which is something that I think the U.S. electorate desperately wants. Uh, very quickly, uh, we had a question from Mike V, uh, Dr. Horn, about Africans working on their own military treat organ treaty organization with the Car Caribbeans and the Latin American countries. What, 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 is that something that is that possible? Is that an option on the table that Africans can start to say, OK, we see what's going on. We're getting hit because from everything from food shortages on this part of the continent. Can something be worked out among African countries? Well, certainly there are very intriguing meetings taking place between the Caribbean community, CARICOM, and the African Union. A virtual summit took place just a few months ago. Certainly with regard to the African continent itself, the African Union headquartered in Ethiopia uh, has taken troops from Burundi, from Rwanda, and other African countries and dispatched them to places like Somalia. So to that extent, what the questioner is requesting is already in motion. Mm, mm, mm. Well, we know if Sweden joins NATO, uh, ha uh, Hassan and Dr. Horn, it will join. It will end a 200 year. Check this out, folks. A 200 years of Swedish non-alignment. If Finland, if Finland adopts neutrality, um, 
it's going to follow. It's going to follow a. It's going to be following a bitter, bitter defeat by the Soviet Union during World War II. Um, so the, this whole situation, you know, as one as the Washington Post describes it, there's going to be a major tectonic shift of power uh, between Finland, Sweden, and Russia, and it's all going to be felt by the United States. So this is going to be very, very interesting. Dr. Gerald Horn, Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Thank you so much, dear brother. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Doc. Thank you. Absolutely. Folks, we got to take a quick pause. When we come back, let's continue the conversation. We're going to switch gears from what's happening internationally to bring it in home domestically. You probably have already noticed, like I've noticed, rent has gone up. Now people are asking the question, is it a good time to rent or is it a good time to buy? We're going to be checking in with realtor Cassandra London to give us some insight about where the market is right now. And then later we check in with uh, Melina Abdullah, who is the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter, Matter LA chapter about her harassment at the school she taught at, Cal State. We'll have that discussion as well as about uh, uh, the funding for Black Lives Matter and some of the big trials of the larger movement. We'll have that conversation. So we still got a lot to get to. So stay tuned for the second 30 of the culture right here on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. We support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I gotta defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a black man <laughs> owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Rolling was amazing on that. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? Folks, are you in a turmoil about where to move and the cost that it will, uh, how much it will cost and the impact it will make on your budget? Well, check this out. A lot of people are in the same space, folks. It looks like that due to inflation, the cost of living in a lot of your big cities and small towns have just gone up. And it's causing people to ask the question, is it a right time to rent 
was the right time to buy. Here to give us some insight about the market, uh, the rental and the buy and, and the housing market is the realtor and founder of the London Group, Cassandra London. Cassandra, thank you so much for joining us here today on The Culture of the Black Star Network. How are you? Thank afternoon? you for having me, Faraji. I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to discussing the housing market, rental market, anything real estate. <laughs> Throw it at me, you know. I'm here to educate. So I'm excited. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Folks, we are still joined by our culture crew member, Mr. Politics himself, Hassan Giordano, as well. So we'll be bringing him into the conversation in a few moments. But Cassandra, um, one of the big things that I wanted to, to kind of bring to your to your attention, this is something, of course, you already know. You've been a realtor for a long time. First, you have your company, The London Group, which is composed of, is a Black-owned company. Talk to us a little bit about that first. Yes. Oh, man. So I've been in the real estate um, industry now about 10 years um, here in, in Maryland. And I started out just a single agent, just trying to figure out my way and just really just just excited about helping people. Um, but I've, I've learned so much along the way and I've learned how to really create a new system on um, what I feel works great for home buyers and sellers because we, we we definitely service them all. Um, but when I first started, I worked with a lot of buyers and learned very quickly that, you know, finances are not discussed oftentimes when you're going into the home buying process. So that was that was one of the passions that I had behind it was to really sit down with each client that was open to it and learn more about what For, for that specific client. So that's how the London Group really transpired. Um, yeah. I was just passionate about helping more people and bringing more agents on to educate people more from a different standpoint. So one of the big... So that's how I... Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So one of the big things, Cassandra, that people are seeing, and, and I don't know, I, I, I don't, I can't wrap my mind around it, but it's like, mm -hmm. what the hell is going on in this country? <laughs> <laughs> where, where we're seeing rent mm -hmm. so high, right? We're seeing the housing market so hot. Yeah. It's like, do people want people to change residences? Or every, I mean, what what is really really going on right now? I know, I know. Honestly, it's happening all over the world. So you almost can't even escape it because it's going to happen everywhere. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a hot market. I mean, when you, when you factor in all the things that are happening around the world, um, there's shortages here, there's, there's, um, inflation here, you know, we kind of, unfortunately the economy has to make up, make it up in some way, shape or form. And oftentimes, um, the fed look at rates to try to help with the economy and, and level it back out. Um, but this is a common thing. I mean, this happens. It's, it's a cycle, you know, in real estate. This is not a first time. Um, this didn't happen for the first time. And and when when did we really start seeing a change? Great when the pandemic happened. So around 2019, going into late 2019. Um, but this is a cycle that happens just about every 18 to 20 years where it, it kind of has to level itself back out because it's so high. Eventually, it kind of has to make some changes in order for it to make sense. Um, not only just for the real estate market, but for everything around, um, everything that it affects around the world. So it's it's a common, it is a common thing and it is a cycle. And um, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that because rates are definitely high, rental rates are high. Um, and once rental rates are high, oftentimes you really don't see those leveling back out. They usually stay where they are. How often do you see rents go down? You know, but prices of homes do. You know, eventually, once it's so hot and you just don't have enough buyers um, offering, putting offers on these homes, eventually the seller has no choice but to decrease the price. So that's kind of how it eventually starts to level out. So it's, it, it, would you say at this moment, it's a what, a buyer's market or a seller's market? It's still a seller's market but it's changing. It's changing. So soon we are going to see um, the prices of homes decreasing because this is the thing, you know, when rates kind of go up, 
where right now they're in the high fives going into sixes, um, people get worried, you know, like, you know, what does that look like for me? Or, um, you know, can I really afford that? Oftentimes, a lot of people don't take the steps to even see what that will look like for them. Um, because truthfully, it could be the same amount that they're paying in rent. Um, so what I would say is it is still a seller's market, but it will eventually change because there's going to be less buyers shopping in the market, which would mean there's a lesser buyer pool for the amount of homes that are on the market. And then that forces the seller to decide whether or not um, do they still want to sell, you know, or do they want to um, be proactive and just start to decrease their their prices or start to give um, maybe even incentives that were not even discussed a few months ago. You know, no one was giving um, contribution towards the closing costs to buyers. So you'll start seeing things like that coming back into the, the market as well. I want to just um, talk about some of the, the things that you know, as we have this conversation, and I also want to bring Hassan Giordano, Mr. Politics, who is the uh, founder and owner of DMV Media Group, into this part of the discussion. But new, the Wall Street Journal, they put out a bunch of, um, you know, they did, they put out some data to show mm -hmm. where we are with renting and where we are with buying in this country. So some of the common areas, and I see a lot of people making moves. We've talked about this on the show, Cassandra that a lot of people, especially young black people are moving into the Southern part of the country, the Southwest part of the country, like in down in Texas, Houston, Dallas, and that, that area. Uh, we see that Atlanta is just blowing up, right? Like Atlanta is blowing up. Uh, some folks are moving to Maryland, especially from like the New York and the Northeast corridor. Um, but they're finding, according to the Wall Street Journal, they did uh, uh, this data right. and they found that like, in Atlanta, rent is up 12% for single family rent in Atlanta. Uh, for the home price rent, it's up 22% in Atlanta. Um, and, and I'm wondering, as people are going to these hubs, to these urban centers, I'm wondering, that it, 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 does that help or does that hurt the market the more people come into these, these cities? Well, I think that you know, it can be looked at different ways. I don't, I wouldn't say it's, it hurts, you know, um, yeah. as long as they have the right professional who is like truly guiding them through the areas that they're looking to purchase and understand, you know, what this area may be selling for, what this area may, may go for. Um, I think that, you know, obviously it helps the economy overall when people are buying homes, you know, right. so it, it really is. Is helping to to bring the economy back to a good level of, of where we not necessarily where we were because that's going to probably take some time, um, but at least get it to more in a comfortable state. Um, I think I'm I personally feel that it's not a bad thing for people to come and or even look at different areas and what that real estate may be may be doing. I mean Atlanta being so high, I personally wouldn't probably want to go somewhere that's a higher price, but maybe down south, like there's Charlotte. I mean, it's, it's booming right now. There's so many builders down there building new construction homes and the prices, you know, are are fairly reasonable there in comparison to some other places around around the, um, the other states. But I don't think it's a bad thing um, at all. So that's my, my take on it. Do you think that there needs to be some sort of national policy put in place, Cassandra? to 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 help people with their rent um especially you know in areas like i saw in like new york city uh oh. that you know you can buy a studio apartment hassan little cardboard box type style spot for like two thousand twenty one hundred dollars a month and i'm like whoa um you yeah, know but do you think york. there should be a, a a policy around it because i feel like because of the pandemic i know that there was a moratorium on you know, not putting people out for evictions. But it seems like now we're getting to the end of the pandemic. Things are just skyrocketed because of all of the other factors. So do you think there should be a national policy? What are real estate, you know, realtors like yourself and others around the country saying about making sure that there is some sort of subsidy or there's some assistance or there's some support from the government to ensure that people don't 
get put out of their homes or they they they, they sign up for situations that they can't afford. I mean, what, what can be done on that side as far as you know? Wow. I mean, that's a powerful question. You know, s- something that I would love to advocate for. Yeah. Because it's just an unfortunate thing that there are people who've been affected by this um, tremendously. You know, they're still trying to catch up from months and months ago and, you know, are just unable to really take care of their rent. So truthfully, absolutely, if there was something that could be done, some type of subsidy. I just think that, you know, if it were to happen, it just has to be used the right way. Yeah. Definitely take that and utilize that for your priorities, whatever is the main priorities, take care of them first. And then after that, you know, then you can work a little harder, hopefully to just get where you need to be. But I I just, I I would pray that that is going to happen. I just don't know. I mean, the first go round, I mean, so many people who were able to, you know, benefit from the subsidy that did happen the first time, but I also know a lot of people who just didn't utilize it the best way possible. And unfortunate because that's a broken cycle in itself that we could probably talk about in so many different ways. But if I could vote, and I'm sure plenty more agents would would love to do that. Is to just you know, after, once this is over, we don't want everyone to be in a even worse place than maybe a lot of people were right. prior to this. Right. So if there was something that could be done, I would definitely cast my vote. Absolutely yes. And I know there's so many more agents that will feel the same way. Hassan, what, what what's your take on that? I mean, uh, it seems like. You know, we were we were talking about the war in the first segment, but I, I'm thinking about the quality of life, cost of living in in cities across this country, bro. It's mm-hmm. it's getting to be a real burden, and it seems like there aren't any real consequences against landlords or you know property companies, property owners, to stop you know the increase. I mean, I understand everybody got has to make a, a you know make a dollar, make a profit, but damn. What is a capitalist society, right? And, you know, to no fault of their own, they didn't bring on the pandemic, right? But first of all, I want to say that when we talk about the war, you can couple this with, because we talked about this earlier in the segment, they just, in a blink of an eye, the House passed a $40 billion package to go to Ukraine. $40 billion, not billion, (laughs) not $40,000, $40 billion to go to the aid of another country when we are suffering here in America, right? And so I think Americans are starting to feel that. I mean, we're not even talking about inflation in the race that we see. We're not even getting into the real, you know, nuts and bolts of what's happening. Gas gas prices skyrocketing. We're feeling all of this. And yet these American lawmakers seem to be bass backwards in what they actually can do. Oh, that's right. We can cuss because we're on your thing. Yeah, but we can cuss. We already, already. <laughs> but I cuss they up ass backwards, son. Ass yeah, backwards, backwards, bro. You know, I cuss up a storm. But anyway, I'm going to try to keep the family <laughs> friends. They're back. Look, think about this. The pandemic hit. No fault of anybody's. But America got caught off guard, right? And when we did, we have a president who at the time was telling us, there's nothing to worry about. This will go away in a couple of days. You don't got and then of course we saw what actually happened. But instead of passing policies that will benefit everyone, they started penalizing individuals like renters, like homeowners, people who rent it out, like business owners. And you know, I think that helped people only for a short period of time. At some point, they had to realize that post-COVID, that you were, that moratorium was gonna be lifted. And all those individuals who decided not to pay their rent, not to pay their mortgage, not to pay their phone bill and their utilities, but were still getting money through income and still getting stimulus checks, mind you, decided to go out there and go to Walmart, go on a shopping spree, right? And go on vacations they didn't need, knowing that at some point you're going to have to pay these bills, right? That wasn't going to go away. Lawmakers, instead of giving free money with these stimulus checks should have said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put together a program like you're talking about, Faraji, to make sure, because when you give people money, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to actually use the money in the right way. Right. Instead, you put it in programs like cutting the income tax, rolling back the piggyback tax, even the property tax, right? On people, Baltimore City has the highest property tax in the entire state of Maryland. 
if you reduce our property tax by half, that would do way more for me in my in my community than giving me a twelve hundred dollar stimulus check. Right. Right. These are policies that Americans can do right now. The American government that would not hurt them, but it would greatly benefit Americans across the board. And instead of doing that, their greatest achievement during the pandemic was let's give them a twelve hundred dollar check and let them go ahead out there and, and spend that on whatever. Yeah. yeah, that stimulated the economy for all but two point four seconds. And right. next thing you know, <laughs> the next day came around, everybody was broke all over again. You Come still on. had the bills, you still were losing your house, and nothing, a damn thing ain't get solved. So until American policymakers across the board start to really be innovative on how they do things to help not just stimulate the economy, but help the American people from a long-term perspective, not just the immediate needs, but a long-term perspective, we're going to find ourselves in these situations over and over and over again. I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think that to, to Hassan's point, Cassandra, that's why we still have this housing gap between black homeowners and white homeowners. Uh, there was an economist with the who was with the Mortgage Bankers Association, Mr. Mike uh, Frantatoni. And Mr. Frantatoni said, quote, the housing gap between whites and between white and black households ownership in the U.S. is about as wide as it's ever been. That black people and white people, in terms of home of owning homes, owning property, it's not there. It is not there. According to the Hill.com, uh, it said that in a housing market with mortgage rates hitting five percent, and real estate investment companies looking to take advantage of these surging rent prices, uh, home ownership is becoming increasingly difficult for black Americans. Cassandra, how how are realtors like yourself and other black realtors trying to at least stop the hemorrhaging uh, and to stem the tide uh, of what we're seeing happening and to try to bridge the gap between black and white home ownership? Yeah, it's unfortunate that that is the case, but it's been that way for a very long time. Mm -hmm. You know, they've created things like redlining. I mean, there's blockbusting. There's so many things that were unfortunate. We we were blindsided by what was even going on um, until it maybe just was blatantly had happened to you and you were actually, unfortunately, someone who was affected by it. Um, so this has been going on years and years, but now here we are, right? And, you know, there has been some changes, but I'll speak to like people shopping in Maryland and at least even Baltimore City um, because there are programs that are out there um, specifically for Baltimore City from buyers who make a certain amount of money. There is a cutoff, but there is one called the Baltimore City Block Grant that used to be $5,000 that you can put towards the purchase of your home or closing costs or down payment. But mm. now it's actually been increased to $10,000, um, which is double, which is nice. And I mean, that in itself, depending on the house that you're going to buy, can really take care of a huge portion of um, of your of your closing costs. And now that we're going into a market where, you know, the buyer pool is just becoming smaller, sellers are more open to um, concessions. And what that would mean is, you know, if there's a seller who has a home and they have a buyer who wants to make a deal work, but the buyer can't afford all their closing costs, the seller can give um, a contribution towards their, their closing costs. And that varies based on the loan product that you're going to utilize, but there's an FHA, there's conventional there, and then it kind of goes from there. Um, but those different products um, allow the seller to give certain amount of, of monetary help to the buyer. So if you combine these programs that are available, like the Baltimore City Block Grant, there's also Live Near You Work, John, um, a John Hopkins grant that's up to like, you can you can almost um, stack it. It's like 17 grand that you can put towards the purchase of your um, home. So there's programs, things of that nature that I think that us as a community, we need to be open to learning about what's available um, and also taking a step, even if it feels scary, even if you don't know, you're not educated about it. You know, just picking up the phone um, and speaking with someone such as myself um, I will, I'm always open to sharing what it is that I know mm -hmm. and then figuring out what might work for you. And listen, if you have some people have actually still are saving money 
during this pandemic. I've met some great people, some great buyers um, who have who have been doing that, who've created good habits, and they have the money that they have saved. But the, the thing is, for me, I don't want them to spend it all. I want them to still utilize these programs. Like go into that, still keep using, you know, keep doing those healthy habits that you've been doing to be able to save up ten thousand, twelve thousand dollars. Um, but let's use these programs. Let's use them and then save that money. I mean, yeah. the way that I see it like this is you have to almost put your investor hat on right now and take off my first time home buying hat. You know, keep it on to ask questions and learn. But when you look at the market right now, as you can become one of those landlords as well, who is, you know, benefiting from the market with people who are paying rent. And if you can get into a home, you know, two hundred thousand dollars, which is the average um, sale price right now in Baltimore. Purchase a home at that price point, stay in there for a little, maybe a year. You know, utilize those programs and then turn around and rent it out. Maybe give someone a chance or an opportunity to rent your property. You know, and I think that would be the more positive way to look at it because it's going to eventually change again. But if you know, and it's going to happen again, so be prepared to have. Um, things in place to be ready for when this were to happen again. Well, it certainly is going to be something that we're going to keep our eyes on. Here's some data to, to keep in mind, folks, as, you know, even though we're, we're going to end this part of the conversation, but here's something to consider, folks, that, that home ownership rates for Black Americans have actually declined between 2010 and 2020. So you're talking about a 10-year time span, and it stands at 43.4%, while the home ownership rate for white Americans is 72%. 0.1%. For Asian Americans, the rate is 61.7%. And for Hispanic Americans, it's at 51.1%. So that goes to show you that when we're talking about the gap, the home ownership gap in this country, it's much uh, deeper, much wider than we think. And we are at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of home ownership. And so you know, Cassandra, it, it's going to be it's going to be something like there's going to have to be some real intentional effort to that's going to have to be made in order to bring people in to close the gap and then get them into these homes. So we will certainly keep our eyes on what's going on with the market. Cassandra London, who was a realtor and founder of the London Group. Thank you so much for your time, sis. We truly appreciate it. And my man, Hassan, thank you for checking in, sir. It's always a pleasure to hear your analysis and insight, brother. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Politics himself, who is the owner of the DMV Media uh, uh, Daily Media Group. Thank you so much, Brother Hassan. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick pause. When we come back, we're going to have our conversation with the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter Los Angeles chapter, Sister Melina Abdullah, to talk about what happened when she tried to go to a ticketed mayoral debate at Cal State and why it led to her being forcefully Remove. Plus, we're also going to talk to her about her thoughts around the latest bombshell around Black Lives Matter, about the appropriation and the use of money that they have received and a whole lot more. And then later, we check in with mental health advocate and race scholar, Brother Richard Rowe, to ask the question, when is the best time and how do you talk to your children about American racism? We'll have those conversations up next in the next hour. So stay with us. That's all coming at you here on The Culture, right here on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie.
pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Folks, welcome back to the second hour of the culture right here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Folks, just a dynamic first hour. Let me just tell you, if you haven't had a chance to check out the conversations that we've had about um, everything from the latest that is happening in Russia and Ukraine to what's going on with the housing and rental market, definitely check out the first hour. We had a lot of good, um, very good special guests and a lot of good conversation. And hopefully you gained something from it as much as I did. So Make sure you do that on the replay. But in the second hour, we wanted to have another conversation about activism because we know that as we have continued to see across the country, there has been a number of issues that have uh, uh, have gotten our attention, especially between issues of race, between blacks and whites, and of course, between blacks and the police. And so one of the big organizations that has been on the forefront of this movement has been Black Lives Matter. Well, we are going to be checking in with the co-founder of the Los Angeles chapter of Black Lives Matter to talk to us a little bit about the work that she's doing and the BLM LA is doing. But there was a situation that went down just last week where this sister, Sister Melina Abdullah, went to a ticketed mayoral event and apparently there was an issue there where she was forcefully removed. Look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick pause. I'm going to share with you more of her story, and we're going to have our conversation with Sister Melina. So stay with us. That's happening next here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Hey, Blake, I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on 
own media and be scared. You dig? All right, folks, we wanted to have our conversation about what's going on with Black Lives Matter, the trials of Black Lives Matter. In a few moments, we're going to be checking in with the uh, co-founder of the Los Angeles uh, Black Lives Matter chapter, Sister Melina Abdullah, to talk to us about the latest work that they're doing um, in, in the midst of the controversy around uh, the, the, the bombshell that was dropped by the BLM founder, Patrice Cullors, and in the midst of the fact that Molina, Sister Molina, was harassed and forcibly removed from a ticketed mayoral debate in Los Angeles from the uh, campus of Cal State LA. And so we'll have Sister Molina on. Um, but I wanted to bring in culture crew member Rashad Staten to, to talk to us a little bit about you know where Black Lives Matter is um, as we continue to see this movement grow continue to see this this movement you know really take shape in a lot of ways but it's also Rashad this movement has been under a lot of controversy uh, we do know publicly that the movement was able to bring in 90 million dollars as a result of this activism efforts and then the the it's once the money started coming into the picture brother everything else started the scrutiny started to intensify uh, for the Black Lives Matter, the, the the global uh organization. And I remember reading some uh some 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 excerpts in you know the interview that Patrice Cullors did, the BLM founder, one of the BLM founders, and she said that she never they never expected and they weren't really prepared for Black Lives Matter to blow up the way it did that they never it, it it was it was like it started as a hashtag online that evolved into a full blown nonprofit organization and that they weren't really prepared they never expected these things to happen and i you know i, I don't know if if years from down the road Rashad we're going to see this as a cautionary tale of of you know what happens when you start a nonprofit organization from social media, but it just seems like there were a lot of I mean there's been a lot of high expectations about the work. There's been a lot of scrutiny. I mean, what 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 do you make of this story of Black Lives Matter as, as the story continues to evolve? Yeah, peace and blessings. Always, always good to be peace on the brother. culture and for the culture. Um, how do I state this? And I'm, I'm gonna make sure that my words are intentional. Um, one is when I think of Black Lives Matter, I, I love the messaging and what it says in blatant terms that our lives do matter um, and not negating those that often try to go to the opposite end of that spectrum saying all lives matter. I think it's a one and all. If all lives matter, Black Lives should be included, inclusive of that approach in itself. Um, like you said, uh, a movement with, that was birthed out of the social issues that we seen trending and going viral on our ways and seeing black bodies being murdered, castrated in modern days lynchings by our law enforcement agencies. I think that is it was timely and purposeful that it's sitting with. Uh, and I like the idea that it's still, you know, functioning and still has its own purpose. The idea of now the scrutiny that's behind any black organization, if we know our history, you know, I'm a history lover. When have we not ever been scrutinized, even for doing the betterment versus those that's being destructive? We have always been the ones that have been the specimens that have been investigated, um, interrogated and exploited, even when we go in the rightful manner. So I think the intent of the organization and how it built itself up. Um, I respect it and I honor the work that it has done because it has made some progressive impact on our community as far as um, law and policies and even increasing the idea of having courageous conversations around race, um, trauma-informed practices, conscious biases, unconscious biases, DEI work, diversity, equity, inclusion work, and the idea of critical race theory. I think all of this seen an upsurge once we started to see the Black Lives Matter movement. So I give honor and recognition for them 
to see an opportunity and lean towards it and creating it into a functional um, organization in the business. And I'm not surprised that it is being scrutinized because when have we never been scrutinized as a people? Right. And I think that's one. Um, and when it comes to the money and those in particular, when you are a nonprofit entity, your money is public money. So those that's digging further into it, they're just doing what they have the accessibility to do. And if we are operating in good intent and good manner and fiduciary responsibilities, then your check account and your bank account should be open to the public to lean into getting their own perspective and own understanding of what the organization was. So what I have to say, I'm curious to uh, hear from the sister once she joins us, but I think Black Lives Matter and what the word is saying and how the messaging is, it lifts up the value of black humanity. Um, we always follow the dollars. Anybody know me? I before I lean towards anything, I follow the dollars that I knew from the front end who was actually funding these organizations. Um, so I have less scrutiny on them as I look towards the real impact. And that's the work that they're doing. Um, yeah. And I, that's that's the most important work. Without that, where would we be now? Will we be still seeing these progressive movements? Um, I think it was one that is not even reactionary, but Black Lives Matter in the movement of its origin. Um, with a proactive approach to the work. And I think it is still has this, um, still shows remnants and it still shows this level of effectiveness to this day. Um, when we get into the monies and, and the, the, the duality between the people and the movement, um, there's always human fault at play, right? Yeah. So we always lean into that human fault. But if we look at the impact, I think they've done their part. But it takes us as individuals to make sure that this collective movement stay afloat and we see the betterment of our people. Do you think, Rashad, that that the that the criticism and the scrutiny of BLM is is unrealistic compared to the the, the criticism and the scrutiny that we give to white organizations, white social justice organizations? No, completely. There's an imbalance. Um, and we've seen this from the insurgents that we've seen on Capitol Hill for those riots, which was the actual riot to the uprisings that we see in our community. There was not as much scrutiny um, to get these people. Yes, we know that some people have been investigated. Some people have been in prison and some people have court cases. But the reality of how they have done one versus the other when it comes to black people and brown communities, we know that there's an um, a imbalance in how our agencies, our institutions and law enforcement often investigate us. Um, the scrutiny is, is there because everything is public record and it's a public facing movement. Um, but what I think we should do is just stay steadfast in it and everybody be respectable of each other's lanes when it comes to advocacy work. Everyone doesn't have to hit the front line. Some people can use their money to persuade. Some people can use their network to, to organize. Some people can create opportunities. Some people are there to sustain opportunities. And there's people that are considered social disruptors that dismantle systems, right? Yeah. So if we find yeah. our lane and we operate in our lane, we don't need a singular organization to propel our movement, our culture, and our community. We all can work individually, but more effectively, we can work collaboratively to keep the work moving, even if there is a um, an actual void or there's a, a, a eradication of Black Lives Matter itself. But the remnants of what that message is that Black Lives Matter is going to exist is always going to exist. And I hope that we always honor what that has done for us in the community in the last decade or so. Mm. I want to bring in our sister now, who is the uh, the the co-founder of the Los Angeles chapter of the Black Lives Matter, as well as the t she's also a tenured professor of 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 African American history, Sister Melina Abdullah. Sister Melina, always a pleasure to have you joining us here on the show. How are you this afternoon? I'm okay. Great to be here and great to listen in and really appreciate that analysis that Brother Rashad gave, which I think was spot on. Um, I'm also the director of Black Lives Matter Grassroots, which is the on the ground work that Black Lives Matter continues to do globally. Um, so it's our collection of chapters and um, campaigns and movement work that's um, going on all around this world, um, including here in Los Angeles. Fantastic. Sister Melina, first and foremost, um, I, I read about what happened to you at Cal State you being removed uh, by force by LAPD. Um, and this was happening, um, and Keenan, if we want to show that video, brother, please. Uh, this was happening during a mayoral event where there were a number of protesters out there because they were protesting, saying that all the candidates at this mayoral event was not being represented. 
And as a result of that, police decided to take you into custody and others. And we're showing this video right now, Sister Melina. Um, what, 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 tell us what was going on. What, what led to you being removed? What led to the fact that, you know, there wasn't, it didn't seem like and there were anyone that really came to your aid? So let me give you the moments before um, the violent removal, my violent removal. So you got the, what happened, what people captured outside of the event, but inside the event, um, it was in a student union theater, which accommodates about 192 people. There were less than 20 folks in. I've been a professor at Cal State LA for 20 years. I teach black power. Um, and I have my students there and I told them there's a mayoral debate. You know, we're going to go, we're going to analyze it. We're going to talk about what it means that the black first viable black woman candidate is running. Um, and they were denied entry, but I've been there 20 years. So I know every entrance to every building. So I just walked around and walked in through another door and sat in the theater. And as I was sitting there, the director of the center that was sponsoring it walks up to me. I've also known him for more than 20 years. He walks up and says, this is a ticketed event. I had on my mask. So I took off my mask and I said, it's me. And um, he doesn't say anything. But 20 minutes later, it was actually campus police come in. And um, one of my colleagues was asked to leave and she left or starts to move and then they tell me to leave and I protest, contest that, not protest, but I said, I teach here. Next thing you know, they grab me by my shoulders um, and drag me down the aisle. I'm reaching for my purse. Um, and when I get to the end of the aisle, the two male officers yell out to the women officers, grab her feet. And they grabbed me by all fours, each of them tugging in a different direction. I'm yelling, you're hurting me. Um, none of the candidates on the stage did anything. All of the candidates were on the stage. Um, the director of the center doesn't say, hey, leave her alone. They actually carry me through the building. And why it looks like no one came to my aid is because about 50 folks were trying to get in through the front door. Um, they saw me being carried out through the back door. And so it took them some time to run around the back. Um, and about 50 to 60 folks were actually able to free me from police custody. And what's happened since is I'm very proud of my university, um, my university's faculty. On Tuesday, um, we decided that, you know, it's the president of the university whose name is Bill Covino who enabled this. And so a vote of no confidence was taken in him and 91% of the academic Senate voted no confidence in Bill Covino and were um, and voted to look at alternatives to policing on our campus. So I was severely harmed. It was May Day, it was the last day of Ramadan. It was uh, the first day of Teacher Appreciation Week, all of these things happening. I was harmed physically and I was also um, humiliated, right? So my legs spread open, you know, I was dressed, but you know, it was not um, a way that anyone should be treated. Um, and we're gonna turn that harm into something that's a victory for both the campus, but also the broader black community. And, and one of the big things is the Molina is that you're calling for the president of Cal State to, to resign. Is that correct? Yes. We're calling for him to resign, to step down, or be removed by the board of trustees. And what has been, as a result of that call, of that demand, what has been the feedback that you received? So that's the no confidence vote, that 91% okay. of the academic Senate agrees that he needs to go. So, so this all happened, I mean, just to let to let our watchers know, you were, you are a tenured professor. You, this is where you, this is how you, this is where you got your tenure at Cal State. Yes, I'm a tenured professor. I was chair of Pan-African Studies for nine years. I've been teaching there 20 years. Um, you know, have a, I'm an academic senator, so I'm part of the university's leadership. 
Um, no one should be treated like that. But if I could be treated like that, that means anyone can be treated like that. And we know that the president of Cal State LA has a really long history of anti-Blackness. Um, they're very angered um, by the fact that the majority, um, or at least half of the original members of Black Lives Matter come from the Department of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. It was, you know, we, we Black Studies, um, Pan-African Studies is about developing intellectual tools so that we can work for the freedom of our people. And so, you know, in 2013, when Black Lives Matter was birthed, it was students and faculty from Pan-African Studies in the streets birthing Black Lives Matter, not only in Los Angeles, but that would be the first chapter that then births this movement that becomes the largest global movement for racial justice in the history of the world. Um, and you would think that anybody like us who say, you know, well, that's what universities should be doing. They should be honing those intellectual tools. We'd be praising that. But instead, if you are uh, leadership or misleadership like Bill Covino, you see that as a threat and you try to squash that, including attacking people like me and others. I'm not the first person to be attacked. He's called campus police on students. He's called campus police on faculty and been really, really anti-Black over his nine-year legacy. And so we're saying that that legacy needs to come to an end now. So there were, there were I mean, this was a mayoral debate. You had some of your the major candidates running for uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, President Karen Bass and others. What did they do they while did this nothing. was all happening? They did absolutely nothing. And that's also, you know, hurtful. Um, I've also known Karen Bass for 20 years. Um, another one of the so-called front runners, his name is Kevin DeLeon. I've known him for 20 years. In fact, he was my student. Um, I often take credit for him because he took my class voting campaigns and elections, and now he's in office, right? Mm. Um, these are people that um, Karen and I communicate on at least a weekly basis. And so I actually, as I was being hurt, um, I said, they're hurting me. And I called both of them by name and neither of them lifted a finger or said a word. Mm. That's 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 a that's a hard pill to swallow, Sister Melina. It is. This, this it is, is a hard pill to swallow to see to hear the story, and, and we want to let's bring Rashad back into this as well. Um, to hear this story, and to, you know, it's it's a very hard pill to swallow. Like, there's one thing that you can disagree with a person, you know, on their ideology or their philosophy or their, you know, when it comes to, you know, certain issues. But it's another thing when 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 things get physical, especially for black women, when black women are involved, that no one d has done anything. Um, I read, Sister Molina, that there were about 50 people that were in attendance for this debate that this wasn't, even though it was, in a, it was in a big venue, that there weren't a lot of people there. Um, did, did anybody come to your aid uh, while this was all going on? So there were about 50 people outside who'd been okay. locked out of the event, but inside that theater of that seats 192 people, there were about 20 people, and that includes the candidates and the media. In fact, it was so sparsely attended that I heard the cameramen who were standing behind me going, where is everybody? Where are all the students? And the truth is the students were locked outside. Wow. Wow. Yeah. This, just listening to our sister one, I want to say um, we see, we recognize, and we honor you for your work. Um, and I'm fortunate that you had to go through this, but thank you for standing in whom you are in your work, it sounds like much of a powder keg situation that it was brewing over years, but it had to take this one particular incident to move things and have these courageous decisions that should have been addressed years ago. So, but thank you for being, you know, an unwarranted martyr. And I think most of the time who acts to be a martyr in that work, um, but I, I'm grateful that you're still alive and you still be able to give your voice to, to the unfortunate circumstance. But being the, 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 the change agent and the champion you are for us as a community, thank you for still staying steadfast in your work. 
Uh, but what, what, what gets me is these three points as I'm listening to your story. Um, one is the idea of around having a closed ticketed event for a forum that is oh, that should be um, that is centered around public elected officials. Right. So what is the intentionality of having a ticketed event that is minimum in representation and people being in the audience on a large scale university that has its own department that is building up young people and it shows this validity and impact as one of the young people that was a past student as elected official and often going towards um, expanding into another uh, political office. It calls into question the intent of that actual form, the college and the university, and as well as seeing the interests of the young people in the communities that wants to be there, why not create space for them to hear the same person, if elected, that will have the pen and power that directly impacts their community. And that is an issue that we have around civic engagement. If we are gonna be civically engaged people, we need mm -hmm. the space um, to do so, to hear directly from those people. And the second one is when they see these situations happen and you have an interpersonal, um, intergenerational relationship with these elected officials that are serving or are candidates to serve in position, when you have these um, incidents that happen in real time and you see them not show up and use their power and influence to um, address or be resolute in that manner, it makes you question what would they actually do once they are elected. Mm. And the third part is uh, with our sister, you know, with anyone that understands or have went into higher education knows that getting a tenure position is not easy at all. Um, it comes with a sense of that person had their own credibility, expertise, and knowing their work and the impact and how it can directly build up the credibility of the institution, but also how they pour into our young people that this sister has done her work, her work shows for itself, that is she, if there is not any place where an intellectual should feel at home is, it should be on a college university. And to possess and exemplify that power, that skill set and your intellect and be closed out of the opportunity for you to exude that, it calls into question the university and it calls into question, when do we allow and create lanes for our people to show up in their strengths? If she cannot show up in her strength of what that is and to bring her students in there to implement their skills and what they're learning in real time, is our colleges and university really servicing their purpose? Mm -hmm. Sister Molina. I would just, you know, I, I appreciate all that was shared and I would just, I guess, um, underline some of the points that were made, especially the points around the candidates. Um, if they're running for mayor of Los Angeles, you know, one of the things that we saw is after, um, after the um, abuse happened, everybody was outraged. And, you know, I'll, I'll send you some of the video of what happened inside, because what happened inside was even more horrific than what happened outside, right? Um, and so I'm yelling, you know, they're hurting me and calling them by name. What the candidates said, Karen Bass and Kevin DeLeon said, is they acknowledge that they know me very well, that they've known me for 20 years, and then said, we didn't know that was her. What um, bothers me is one, I don't believe them. Um, that I've, I think I'm pretty recognizable. In fact, when I yelled out, I even took my mask off to make sure they could see me. Um, and it's a, even though it's a 192 person theater, that's still very small. So um, the debate hadn't started, they could see. Um, I also have a radio show and have a pretty distinctive voice. So I mm -hmm. think they would recognize my voice um, even if they didn't see my face. But I think the bigger point is what if it wasn't me? So what? So what if it wasn't me? What if it was some other black woman faculty who's saying, I teach here, you're hurting me and calling for help. You shouldn't have to know that person in order to come to their aid. And if that's the kind of leadership we're looking at, that's not the kind of leadership I desire um, for the city. I think that anytime someone is being abused by police, especially leaders should hop in and at the very minimum, say, what's going on? Question it, you know? 
So this this situation here, Sister Melina, it just continues to add to you know the trials that Black Lives Matter has been under, um, where there, there some people are losing their you know with the alliances that were made over the past few over the past decade are starting to what some people would say are starting to kind of fall apart because some people say a hey, BLM is still, you know, saying this and that, but the reality is, is that, you know, the conditions of black communities and other folks, things aren't really changing. The the latest controversy around how the money is used. So people are saying, well, why should we help them when they seem to be self-serving? And, and I, you know, and I wanted to bring you on because one, I wanted to, for you to tell your story unapologetically and unfiltered in an unfiltered way. But then two, you know, where, how should people start to look at the work that you're doing as an individual, as a, as a Black woman activist, as a tenured professor, but then looking at the work that you're doing as part of this larger this larger uh, movement? You know, uh, how do people, you know, what do you advise for people to do or how to look at this situation and say, well, okay, well, Sister Melina was hurt, but I don't like Black Lives Matter because of A, B, and C. It, you know, I, I don't know if if the buy-in or if the trust and faith that people have for Black Lives Matter um, is is as strong as it used to be where a moment like this, they would have normally stepped in a few years ago. But now that things have, have changed, you know, how, how do you want people to look at this situation? It's just trying to wrap my, my head around it. Yeah. So I do want to say that as terrible as it was what happened to me, people did step in. And again, they wrestled me, literally physically wrestled me um, at great risk to themselves away from, you know, the police who were trying to bring me harm. Um, so I want to lift that up. And I want to say if there's beauty in anything, there's beauty in that. Um, I also want to say, of course, We've all witnessed what's been happening with the assaults on Black Lives Matter. And I really, again, appreciate Rashad's grounding in Black political history, right? If we think about any movement for Black liberation, so Black Lives Matter is not about, you know, okay, there's these systems, we want reform. We're saying that these systems were built in order to bring harm to Black people, right? Prisons descend from plantations, police descend from patty rollers. There is no reforming that, right? We have to completely reimagine systems of public safety and invest deeply in systems of care. We can't think that um, by moving police into our neighborhoods, that's gonna be the solution. In fact, as a black mother of three children who lives in a black neighborhood, I don't want police living in my neighborhood. What I want is strong neighborhoods where, you know, everybody has the resources that we need, right? Where um, the community is nurtured, where we have food and good jobs. Those are the things that we need. And when we say that that's what we're advocating for, that's what we're fighting for, that's what we're putting our bodies on the line for. And now with people having poured money into Black Lives Matter, we actually have some resources to do some things. That is a direct threat to white supremacy. And so, of course, we're taking on the full on backlash of those who want to maintain a system that brings us harm, that exploits us for their benefit. And so much of what you're seeing in terms of the assaults on Black Lives Matter if you think about the outlets they come out in, these are not real media sources. So the Washington Examiner is not the Washington Post and the New York Post is not the New York Times. So people need to be a little bit more savvy about who's putting what out. Um, we also need to be thoughtful about, you know, some of the attacks around did Black Lives Matter buy a property? Yes, Black Lives Matter bought a property. You know who else has property? the Red Cross, the American Cancer Society, the ACLU, virtually every organization that has any resource, including Black organizations like the NAACP and the Urban League, 
this is one of the ways that we sustain our dollars. And we need to, to remember that even though tens of millions of dollars poured in in 2020, that was unprecedented and it may never happen again. So it's our duty to make sure those dollars stretch. And I'm saying that as one who's actually not on the money side of Black Lives Matter. I'm the director of Black Lives Matter grassroots, which means I'm the movement side, not the money side. But I'm saying that I understand the need to stretch those dollars so that we can continue to do the work on the ground. And I think that our pushback as Black people who want freedom for our folks has to be, look, we need to deeply invest in this work. What's happened over the last eight and a half years, Black Lives Matter was born July 13th, 2013, the day that the murder of Trayvon Martin was acquitted. Um, we need to remember that in the last eight and a half years, we have built a tremendous force. I don't know if people remember pre-2013, when anytime we said Black, we had to hide it under this umbrella of people of color, or we had to follow it up very quickly and go Black and Brown as if we couldn't just say Black. The idea of saying unapologetically that Black people require freedom, my children require freedom. Future generations require freedom is something that's been ushered in. And that has um, meant differences in the ways in which we're represented in media. It's meant um, a commitment to liberatory models of education. It's meant a pushback against the assaults that we experience every day at the hands of police and prison systems. And so it means that for Black people, we can't allow a backlash, a white supremacist backlash who wants to hold on to old ways of being to um, really cause us to turn our backs on the most viable movement of our lifetimes. Mm. And at this point, Sister Melina, do you, do you want people to, do you think that people are justified in walking away, not showing their support for Black Lives Matter, or do you what are your thoughts around that? Sister Molina? Um, we have a protest in front of the police association. I don't know if you're in Los Angeles. Um, every single week, and they're not the hundreds of thousands of people that we saw in the street in 2020, but it is hundreds of people. Um, so the idea that people are turning their backs on Black Lives Matter actually is not true. It's that, you know, in a moment where we're moving out of a pandemic, when we're trying to find our footing financially, um, people can't be in the streets Forever, um, we're still resolute. We're still saying names like Peter Leoya um, or Patrick Leoya, who was um, murdered in Grand Rapids. We're still lifting up names like Andrew Joseph III, who was 14 years old when he was murdered as a result of police action in Tampa, Florida. We're still fighting for Black lives and demanding changes in policy in terms of Andrew Joseph's name, we're demanding the end of qualified immunity, right? We're still taking that on. It just can't forever look like hundreds of thousands and even millions of people in the streets consistently. But we have to fight in every way that we can. Um, I'm especially inspired by the children who are leading the Black Lives Matter in schools work along with their teachers saying that we need to invest heavily in education and nurses and counselors and librarians on our campuses and remove the police who actually daily, on a daily basis, traumatize our children. Um, and they've been really, really successful in demanding care, not cops on their campus and demanding police free schools all across the country, but especially in cities like Los Angeles and Oakland. And so, no, I don't think Black people are turning their backs on Black Lives Matter, but we have to remind ourselves that this work is constant. And um, in the words of Angela Davis, freedom is a constant struggle. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Sister Malina Abdullah, we uh we truly appreciate you. I'm I'm glad to hear and we're glad to hear that even with that uh that interaction that you had with the LAPD that um that you were not harmed severely to the point uh or fatally. Um, so we appreciate your time and you telling us you're part of the story. And you you know, we, we know that this continue this conversation will continue, but we certainly appreciate you for coming on and, and sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you so much, Brother Faraji. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I want to do this. I want to I want to just we're going to be bringing my brother Richard Rowe into the conversation. I want to bring Rashad back into it because um, I'm reading just some of the con the, the comments, Rashad. And um, we I, I, I got to I got to address something. I got to address something. Because I think that people tend to believe that, and I see, I see you, Brian, amplified. I see you. I'm not going to bring a black woman onto a show like this and crucify her when she has already gone through a traumatic situation as it is. This is the Brian amplified. He said, Faraji. He told me to grow a pair, Brother Rashad, and stop with the weak questioning, hold the feet to the fire. Grow a pair. Hold the feet to the fire. That's a black woman that's been doing work. She's working. And as part of her work, she has been harassed. She has been abused emotionally. Physically, she was manhandled. And you want me to bring a black woman who has been working on the liberation of black people onto a black network on a black platform to speak to our culture and crucify her? That's what you want to see? You want me to blaze Black Lives Matter to the point where, yes, they have been undergoing some really heavy trials. We know that. But does that take away from the, the awakening that they have caused black people, black children, black young people across this country? Does that just diminish all of that? You want me to crucify the sister for that? She clearly said she's not on the money side. She's on the grassroots side. And I bet you, you don't even go out to a damn protest. I can, I can bet without a shadow of doubt, you don't even stand while police are in your face. Grow a pair. Do you know the LAPD visited that sister, came to her home, harassed her in front of her children? Has the LA or has any police department came to your home? Do you know what that's like? Please get out of my face with that bullshit. That's not the purpose of this show. We're going to talk about it. But let me just tell you why we take the stand the way we take the stand. We don't come on here to blaze black people who have been doing work so we can get a round of applause and so we can get people to, oh, yeah, 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 some fodder. No, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. I invited the sister so she can share her story. And then you make your judgments. But don't ever think that our intention is that we stand on the side of weakness when this whole conversation is about making sure that even though Black Lives Matter is going through the trials and the tribulations it's going through, that we can take the best of what they have offered, the best of their work, and then we can build upon that instead of wanting to criticize and condemn and tear down the whole damn thing. You feel me? What I'm saying, brother Shot? Yeah, brother. Um, I applaud you for you standing firm in, into where you believe in your moral standards. I, mean, and your I don't father, yeah, I don't get it. You know, when I'm when I when I hear it, people think it's like, you know, you say find them, right? I think of like, okay, find what? Our testicle fortitude. And if we are men of courage and men of good character and integrity, um, testicle fortitude requires us to tap into our divine masculine. And divine masculine man, if it's definitely a black man, it causes you to have empathy and sympathy for everyone. 
and that level of constructive accountability. So in the face of us assessing what happened in this, this young lady who is a leader in our communities doing na national work, it requires us to give her a platform to voice her lived experience, not us to scrutinize and interrogate her because we are not um, anyone with a badge to interrogate what happened. But us as men in our di divine masculine, we must speak on what the, the masculine man is. Too many times we use platforms to talk about toxic masculinity, but what shows up when we are exemplifying divine masculinity with empathy and sympathy to give somebody voice to their power and to use that platform to raise another where level of awareness. So brother Faraji, I applaud you um, into using this platform to showcase this in which we often need to see. Um, and we seldom get the space to do so, brother. I don't take it any any comments that that brother did for any harm, because I know we're standing in our true integrity and holding up our moral fiber as we are as members um, of the culture of this show and respecting what the whole aim of this show is to be. And that is to build our collective community through having conversations and giving voice to power on a platform so that we can think of the story and not just the one that the media has perpetuated. But when you can hear from someone that has lived through it, maybe that will raise your level of consciousness and awareness. So brother, thank you for standing firm with your testicle fortitude, but exemplifying well, divine that. masculinity, brother, because that says me, a lot about just, you. Let me just tell you what it requires. I, I want to bring, and I'm going to bring my brother in. We're going to bring him brother in, Richard Rowan. Yes, sir. And I, I feel and I feel bad because we, I promise brother Richard that we give him the necessary time. But I, I want to be very clear on this. I want to be very clear. I've been working in black media and, and for, for many, many years. And I've often heard when black people get so, when we get so caught up in our feelings or when we get so upset, right, that we want to tear down the, org the, the, the organization and the institutions mm -hmm. that, that, that could and have the potential to do greater work for black people. But because we are dissatisfied, we want to tear everything down. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Now, the sister, our sister just said the Red Cross owns property. The NAACP owns property. And I'm not going into the weeds and to the, the ends that are. I'm just talking about the fact that we do ourselves a disservice when we become dissatisfied. And then in our dissatisfaction, we become like a little devil where we want to spread dissatisfaction to other people in an attempt to, to discredit or to destroy something that can lead to something bigger and better and greater. Does Black Lives Matter need to change? Absolutely. Does it need to be improved on? Sure. They say what? The biggest room is the room for improvement. But does that mean that it should be totally destroyed? No. You don't say that about the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL. You don't say that about any other organization that don't work on the behalf of black people in this country. You don't question them. You don't scrutinize them. You don't You don't even have the, the damn balls to tell them what to do because they don't even care about what you think. But we want to start to, to try to destroy Black people, and I'm so sick and tired of us wanting to, to take down our organizations and institutions. If you have a problem with the organization, shut your damn mouth and help them to get better. Instead of just talking, oh man, they did this, they did that. Well then take your ass and do something about it. Let's bring brother Richard Rowe into it. I'm sorry, brother Richard. This is my brother. He's my older brother. He's been with, he's been knowing me for years. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy to have him to be a part of the conversation. Brother Richard, I am truly, truly, I have to say, I, I apologize. Don't apologize for bringing don't, don't you don't on soon. I mean, don't apologize for being compassionate and being human, brother. And wanting to display the highest level of compassion for one another. You know, I will never forget a um a quote by Brother Neely Hiller, before I even get started, praises honor to my young brother, Rashad. <laughs> How you doing, Black man? 
Just we are good, brother Ray. In your presence, I stand firm. I'm yes, grateful to share with you. That's right, brother. How you doing, by the way? And it's Paraji, I saw to to you and well, praises to you, brother. No, don't, don't, you know, brother, you should be upset because, again, Millie Fuller once said, and you all know this quote if you don't understand white supremacy, what it is and what it does, and everything will confuse you. And so we have been programmed to attack one another. We have been programmed to basically disparage, denigrate, devalue one another. And that orientation, that programming causes us to think that attacking and undermining and marginalizing and demonizing, doing what the oppressor has done to us is the way we should roll. And we cannot roll like that. We've got to decide and make some decisions about how we're going to roll and how we're going to elevate each other and hold each other up. Should BLM be critiqued constructively? Hell yeah. Should all of our organizations, all of our colleges, all of our institutions be critiqued? Come on, Brother Rich. All of them should be under, under a, a kind of mirror check. I mean, should be moved to mirror check themselves, should be critiqued, but in the most constructive way. I'm an angry black man. I'm an angry black man, but I'm hoping that I'm channeling my anger in a constructive way that will elevate, that will lift up, that will celebrate and honor black humanity. And we gotta basically land there, park ourselves there, man, or else brother, we'll do the same thing. It's really fuller again. We'll be like slaves, what, fighting at the bottom of a slave ship, fighting mm -hmm. each other at the bottom of a slave ship. We can't go out like that. So brother Faraji, I'm sorry that the brother uh, triggered you in such a way that caused you to to respond. And I think you responded eloquently. I think you responded adequately. I think you simply wanted him to know that that's not what your show is about. And that's not who you are about. That's not what black manhood should be about. It's and that's the, and, and Brother Richard, that really comes down to it, right? That's right. Here's our sister who's undergone trauma. Trauma. Trauma, and yeah. then she comes to us as black men, as a black right. man. She right. got my, my my brother Rashad with two black men, and we 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 supposed to be a safe haven for right. our woman, for our sister yes. who's undergone trauma. What the hell I look like beating up on that woman? That's not even in my spirit. I want to beat up on the people that, that mishandled her. Right, right. You know what but, I'm saying? But as a yeah. black man and as a man in general. We got to make a space for black women and for all women to be able to share their pain and then for them to know that they are heard and they are protected. Yes. And especially when black women have been the reason why the skies haven't fallen on us um, on many occasions. The skies, they keep holding up the skies for us. We owe them. For, so Rashad has heard me say this, and this is from uh, Brother Haki Malabuti. Black women, I can't tell you who to love or not love, but we know you haven't been loved enough. And so we got to love our women. We got to love our children. We got to love each other, man, like we've never been hated. And a lot of this is coming from all of that, man. We've been hated, we've been denigrated, we've been criminalized, demonized, marginalized, been all that stuff. And so hurt people do what, y'all? Hurt people. Hurt people, man. Come on, man. No matter what the... <laughs> Gender or the color or, or the or the uh, your color, man. We basically go at each other hard, mean spirited, to really take each other down. We do it in our homes. We do it in our schools. We do it in our communities. We do it in our institutions. We do it in our churches. We go hard against each uh, one another, man. We got to stop that. Just we got to stop. Enough is enough. And so I'm glad that you were, you, you know you basically simply said, look, I'm going to respond. I'm going to share my my perspective and my thoughts about this uh, uh, this issue that was brought to me by another brother who wanted me to really tear this sister down all the way down. And because I didn't critique and criticize me and told me what I didn't possess. But you maintain your humanity, brother, and that's, that's the best you can do. Let me just say this, because, you know, I, I can't stay but for so long. You got to bring me back, brother. You gave Rashad all that time, brother. You gave everybody <laughs> all this time, brother. You're going to give me five minutes. That cannot happen, brother. So, you know, that ain't going to happen. To talk, about, to talk about the topic that we want to talk about, brother, how do you talk to your children about racism? This is about talking to your children about racism, how we respond. You know, to a racist, white supremacist, male dominated, white male dominated, paternalist. How do we respond and why we need to talk to our children about racism? Because, again, if we don't, brother, they will not have the immune system mm. that they need in order to go into this racist, 
this world, man, that continues to try to do what? Tear them down, to devalue them, to disrespect them. I told my grandchildren, my two granddaughters, I told them a long time ago, I said, look, you all, and this was long before all this other stuff happened, when they were young, told them that they were beautiful, that they were brilliant, that they were special, and that I loved them deep. Told them that when they were three and four and five and six, come on. You got to pour that into your children early in order to prepare them and, 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 and protect them and, and give them the kind of protective shield, if you will, that hopefully will provide some protection to them as they enter a world that really has told us time and time again, we don't like y'all. We don't need you all. We don't respect you all. And not, not everybody, not, it's not everybody saying that, but far too many. And so all that to say, Brother Faraji, you're going to have to bring me back, brother. That, I'm going to have to bring I'm, you I'm, back. Because you know, I, right, right with Sean, because he gave a shot. He gave my young brother, and I love it. I was listening. I was too, I said, mm, <laughs> let, me just, let, me, let me listen to this young brother who I, I'm just so proud of him. It makes me feel and know that behind us, Brother Faraji, and you behind me as well, behind us, brother, there are young men and sisters and brothers, man, who can hold this down, who can really continue to fight the fight. It ain't over, as we all know. Mm -hmm. I'm on the panel real quick. You, I'm on the panel last week in D.C., the National Press Club, invited me and a few other folks to put us on a panel, man, to talk about. And this is why I started off by saying I'm an angry black man. The, 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 the panel was Black Male Youth Suicide. Mm. How can I not be angry that we are still 2022 talking about an issue that points to our young people, our children, contemplating what? Taking their lives. Mm. Come on, y'all. That was so upsetting to me. And again, I have volunteered to participate on the panel. I knew what it was going to be about, but I started off by saying, yes, I'm angry that in 2022, that's a subject, a topic that we still have to grapple with. And we talk about all this other kinds of crazy stuff that basically doesn't really say what to our children that we love you, value you, respect you, need you, going to, going to care for you. We're, that, we're not having those conversations enough. So I was saying- well, Richard, I, I gotta hurt, bring Richard. you back on. Yes, you, you do. Drop it, you drop it. Rashad, the man is dropping too much, too many jewels and too much wisdom. <laughs> come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. It's, when it's, the it's, Baba and the Master speaks, I go silent to learn as I understand. Mm, mm, Come on, brother. That paid the way for you and I both and many of us, right? So mm. We stand on his shoulders. He is the giant that mm. gets to allow us to stand on his shoulders and see further so mm. we can continue the mission. That's right. And look, let me just tell you, let me just say this. And brother Richard, you you have always been a, a man that's been, you've watched me personally grow mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. into this struggle, into this, into mm -hmm. this work. But you have always encouraged men to be men, black men to be responsible fathers, responsible caretakers, responsible defenders, right? Mm -hmm. re re responsible guardians of ourselves, of our families, of our communities. And, you know, it when you're talking about the level of racism and I love how you just put this, the level of white supremacist, the white mm -hmm. supremacist mindset in a form of black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about that, that's going to take some real intention mm -hmm. and some real sacrifice and some real work. You know, in Islam, they use the term jihad. Mm -hmm. And so many times, especially in American media, the term jihad is often misinterpreted as being a holy war mm -hmm. with others. Mm -hmm. That's not what it means. The word jihad is a word that means to go to war within, to go to war with the forces within yourself. Wow. Mm. Love it. That make you less than, that makes mm. you unredeemable. To go to war with the forces in yourself that makes you. Uh, to make God to look upon you and frown upon you. Mm. But that's a that's a process. Mm -hmm. That's a process. That's right. It's a process for us to go to war, to want to go and be better men and better women. 
And I think that that's one of the big things that that when we talk about what the culture is about, I'm not talking about no show. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about the idea of culture, the cultures that we are all a part of. It doesn't force us to to go to war with ourselves to check out what I heard the minister say one time, the self-accusing spirit. Mm -hmm. To to un, to tap into the God within, if you if you believe that way, but you know, you and I all know that we have a voice within us that encourages us hmm. to be better in every circumstance, in every right. decision, That's every right. every you know moment. But if you go, if you don't go to war to make sure that that voice is heard loud and clear then you lose a part of yourself. You lose your humanity. Hmm. Hmm. And that's where I think we are. Like the racism is so deep. It's so ingrained in us. We hate ourselves so much. Hmm. We have lost the humanity of ourselves and lost the humanity to see the beauty of our brother and our sister mm -hmm. to the point that we would rather kill them than to save them. Right. And that's it, brother. And, and so I, I know, and again, you know, I, I want to stay, but you know, I can't, but for a few more minutes, but I just want to say this, brother, and I want you to, to hear me when I say this, man, because the body is taking count every day because of the microaggressions, the macroaggressions, the um, implicit and explicit biases. I want you to take a deep breath, brother. I want you, Faraji, to take a deep breath, brother. I want you to breathe a few minutes, man, given what the brother attempted to uh, chastise you and to want you to do something against your own divine spirit as brother Rashad. That's not you. That's not, I would not even be around you if that was you. So you responded in a way that I'm glad you responded. Again, I'm coming back to that because as black men, we've got to check each other, check our sisters. We got to check each other and how we respond, how we show up and what we're going to leave behind for the next generation so that they understand. Because again, we, we could really, have, we, we had time, we could go back and talk about, well, this is what Du Bois and, and Marcus Garvey and Booker T, they got into fights and attacked each other. We could talk about how the movement to diminish or marginalize black women. We could really go down that list, up and down this list of how we have shown up to basically do what undermine one another we can't do that. that that's not that's not a solution for black advancement for moving towards our north star we cannot go at each other in the way that we have been taught i keep coming back program taught oriented to do mm. right with taught oriented miseducated <laughs> programmed and until we deprogram until we at least do what a 12-step program, the first step in the 12-step 12, 12 program is what? Admit yep. that you are what? Sick. Admit that you have an addiction. We have an addiction to attacking each other, harming each other. So again, my, my little presentation today was going to be Faraji and, and Richard. Any issue that harms, injures, causes our children to suffer, or even leads to them dying are issues that we must talk about early and often. So racism exactly. is one of those issues yeah. because it harms, it causes suffering, it causes them to be feel disrespected, and it also basically can lead to their dying. It's an issue, Richard, Brother Faraji, that we must talk about. And so I'm looking forward, brother, to basically I'm bring you back. With invitation, say, brother, bro, come back on and, and bring R Richard back on. But he can't talk as much as he talks. He's not basically <laughs> waiting until I finish, and then we can bring him into the conversation. But I love what he said today. All that I've heard, love him, love you, Faraji. I mean that, but I mean we we. This is about loving each other like we've never been hated, man. We got to do that. That's right. Yes, sir. Right. Sir. Yes, sir. Love each other, man. Compassion. Our humanity has been what. The human, there's five levels of dehumanization. Don't get me started, y'all. Let's just say. Yo, you about to see, you about to take us to school. I ain't got enough time for you right now, bro. Richard, you about to take me to school. Look, trust and believe, family. I'm bringing back my big brother, brother Richard Rowe, who is a mental health advocate. He is an author. He is a race scholar. He has been on the front lines pushing, not on the front lines fighting, but he's been on the front line encouraging us to love one another as black men. 
He is a huge proponent of black fatherhood mm -hmm. and the role of black fathers in the community and in the family. So we will certainly bring you back on, but I thank you so much. Oh my gosh. I, I thank you, you so, so much. It was the perfect way to bring, uh, to introduce you to our audience today. Thank you, brother. Rich. It's only this mutual, man. It's only this mutual, and I love you, brothers. I mean, love it. you I'm too, big brother. Show. Love you too. This is Jimmy Wise. So, for Faraji, Aslam Lakeham to you, brother. And we'll Prashara, you love you and brotherhood, brother. Peace and love. Peace and love, you all. Peace and love, brother Richard. Okay. Thank you so much. Peace. Uh, Rashad, I thank you. You, my always guy, you always get, you always a part of the, these, these the very uh, spirited conversations. So I appreciate you going through the, 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 through the fire and through the journey with me, brother. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much for being so good for the culture, brother Rashad. Always for the culture, brother. Continue walking in your greatness. Absolutely. Praise God. Folks, that's going to do it for me. I, pre I apologize for taking just a little extra time over here, but we thank you for tuning in. I want to thank all of my guests today. Um, from Dr. Uh, Gerald Horn to uh, Cassandra London to Sister Melina Abdullah to Brother Richard Rowe. I'm not saying anything else. I think it all can be said right there. Make sure that you do support us, though, uh, here at Black Star Network, blackstarnetwork.com. Make sure you go to the website. Support us today. We need your support. We need your, your, your showing that you appreciate what we're bringing here to you each and every day. This is black owned media. This is unapologetic. This is unfiltered. And most importantly, this is the media just for you. So make sure you support black star network at blackstarnetwork.com. If you can't support, certainly share all of our programs. And if you get notifications, let your friends and family know, tell them to download the app for free and they can find out how to do that all at blackstarnetwork.com. Folks, stay tuned up at the six o'clock Eastern Standard Time hour is my big brother, Roland Martin. As always, never be afraid to challenge what's wrong. Stand for what's right while being yourself in the process. God willing, we'll be talking tomorrow for another exciting edition of The Culture right here on the Black Star Network. Peace.